Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to episode 132 of the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I'm Tim Robertson, the host of the Observer's Notebook and also the coordinator of the training program within the ALPO. Thanks for listening. The ALPO collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena, and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it alive. If you really enjoy what you hear on the podcast, you can donate to it via Patreon. You can give as little as $1 a month. If you feel even more generous, for $5, you receive early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you receive producer credits on the podcast. You can help us out by going to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com slash Observer's Notebook. If you'd like to join the Alpo, membership begins at only $18 a year. For more information, find us on the internet at www.alpo-astronomy.org. And we're also on the Facebook. Just search for ALPO Astronomy. And yes, this here podcast also has a Facebook page as well. Just search for The Observer's Notebook. If you enjoy, please subscribe. That way you'll never miss any episode. And now, episode 132. And we're going to learn a little bit about telescopes with Rick Hill. Enjoy. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to this edition of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. Today, we have a repeat guest, uh, Rick Hill from the solar section of the Alpo. Welcome back, Rick. Hi. How you doing? Good. 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 Well, today, today we're going to uh, step back a little bit and talk about telescopes. With the holiday seasons coming, there might be people out there that are looking to purchase their first telescope or their second. And we thought we'd break it down a little bit and talk about what's important when purchasing uh, a telescope. So Rick, I, I don't know. You, I've got about five telescopes. Do you have a, do you have a number for the number you have? Oh my gosh. I don't know how many I've had over the years. Uh, <laughs> it's been a lot. It's been well over two dozen. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, that's the thing about this hobby. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're different scope for different objects type thing as well. Well, I started with the ubiquitous uh, 2.4 inch refractor. So, yep, same here. Uh, same here. All right. Well, let's talk about basic uh, terminology before we get into breaking down the types of telescopes. Uh, do you want to start off on this or? Uh, no, you go ahead and lead and uh, I'll right. chime in. All right. Well, one, 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 one thing that's important is a thing called uh, focal length. And focal length is basically the distance the light travels within the optical assembly from the from the front lens or mirror to the eyepiece. It's that distance. And why is that important? Well, with with lunar and planetary observing, you're going to want a lot of focal length, which means you're going to Barlow lenses are going to become your friend. And uh, for me, um, with my cameras that I use, uh, they have. 3.75 micron size pixels on the chip in the camera. So I have to work at at least F20 to get what's called Nyquist sampling. That's a term that uh, basically says you will get all of the um, available resolution out of your instrument if the seeing is perfect, which it never is, but, you know, um, and, and so you have to kind of balance it that way. You have to learn what the term Nyquist sampling is, what the mathematics are for that, and then apply that to your telescope, your focal length, and your camera. And, and that's that's just for astrophotography, but if people want to start off, 
uh, hopefully they start off you know, doing some type of visual observing as well. Yeah, I'm to, I'm to the point now, I'm 72, mm-hmm. so I'm to the point now where the eyes don't work nearly good enough to do a lot of uh, visual work. Okay. All right. Yeah, most people started out, I think, want to use a telescope to look through, I, and then they rapidly want to get into astrophotography, which yeah. is which is difficult because ex- you got to manage expectations and things like that. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, yeah. Magnification is another thing that's highly thought of when you first get into astronomy and buy your first telescope. Well, for, for lunar and planetary observing, kind of the minimum magnification you need to use is 40 times the aperture in inches. So if you're working with a 2.4 inch telescope, for example, uh, you want to be working at a uh, hundred times a hundred X, you know, a hundred power mm-hmm. uh, minimum to get the, the most out of your aperture. And you go up from there, depending on your seeing it's all, everything is dependent on the seeing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, magnification is really not the most important thing. I, I I know the old Sears catalogs and things we all got back in the oh, day yeah. would show these little telescopes that would say 600 power. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's useless power at 600 power. You know, a, so th- a thousand power or something like that. And yeah. they're, not, they're also not, t- when they talk about magnification in those advertisements, they're not... Um, talking about the kind of magnification we are either they're talking about area magnification which can be much greater and mm-hmm. it's, it's a it's a phony number yeah 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 and it will an advertising tool in a lot of ways too now the probably one of the most important things is the aperture and the aperture is the diameter of the main lens or mirror of the telescope yeah and why is and- that important well, it's important because the aperture is what determines the finest detail you're going to see. Uh, the, that's the whole determinant. That and the seeing are the two determinants that are going to uh, tell you how much detail you'll see. Kind of the minimum aperture for lunar planetary and solar observing is like the 90 millimeter uh, telescope. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to do deep sky observing, then, I mean, your aperture is basically the size of your eyeball. You want the bigger aperture to uh, bring it, to bring in more light. Well, for deep sky observing, of course, you're using a DSLR. You can, the aperture is going to be whatever lens you're using, too. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of, of DSLR lenses are, are just a two to three inches aperture. And it's a matter of uh, just how, how long an exposure you can do. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I have for basic terminology. Do you have anything else, Rick, that we should touch on? Not. Uh, we we might come up with something as we go on, but uh, not okay. not right now. Okay. Well, let's break down the different basic telescope types. And we both started off with the same type, the two point four inch refractor. And a refractor, for those who don't know, is basically the spyglass that the you see in the old pirate movies, a straight on telescope with a series of lenses inside. And that's the funny, the funny thing is your list there is virtually the evolution of my uh, yeah. telescopes. That's I started out with a 2.4 inch refractor. I then went to a six inch reflector, an RV six, which were very popular. Me too. In the 19, <laughs> 1960s. That was my second scope. And uh, I sold my RV six to a young girl, 16 year old girl. And we've been married for 47 years now. <laughs> um <laughs> And, and I went from that to Cassegrain and Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh-huh. Um, and now I'm, I'm a big fan, uh, a proponent of uh, Maksutov telescopes because they give you all the qualities of a refractor without the long tube. Wind is a real big problem out here in the desert southwest. And so uh, the short tube Maksutov makes, uh, gives you many more nights of, of productive observing. Right. Well, let's step back and talk about the refractor for a minute. That, yeah. w- w- what are advantages of using a refractor telescope in observing? Long focal length. Okay. Which means power. Unobstructed aperture. Which means uh, you don't have any mirrors or stuff in the middle of it. To- right. Exactly. And those, those are the two big 
advantages, disadvantages, long tube, mm-hmm. uh, and and weight. Right. Is and the, also quality refractors are not cheap. No, no, no. The triplet lenses and everything. No, that's not cheap at all. Yeah. I mean, there's companies out there now, Explore comes to, Explore Scientific comes to mind that have have swapped out the aluminum tubes with carbon fiber, which kind of yeah. helps in the weight. But uh, you know, it's it's like you and I both are, are looking to downsize this the, the telescopes that we have to lug out to, to observe with. So I think that's why we've gone to other ones. But refractors are great starting telescopes. And that's another thing too. If if you're getting up there in years, as I am, mm-hmm. um, you want to consider how much equipment do you want to lug out right. every night, uh, unless you've got a, a, a an observatory, a dome in your backyard, uh, which I can't have. My yard's too small. I have to mm-hmm. roll everything out on wheels. Yep. Um, you want to keep that in mind. I just got an offer of a, of a free Celestron 14 inch to replace my eight inch Maksudov. Mm. And the thing is, that's a beast. That is. And um, I, I had to turn down the offer and I, I wound up refunneling that offer to um, the, the Mount Lemon um, uh, Sky Center so they can use it for their public outreach. It was much, much better. Uh, I could not have handled that. That would have been too much work. I, I, I hear you on that. So anything else about the refractor telescope, though, the advantages and disadvantages before we move on? The only disadvantage is if you're going to get an affordable refractor, it's going to be uh, a two-element objective lens, which is going to have some residual color. Right. Probably some residual spherical aberration. Uh, so you have to go to a triplet lens. And if you go to a triplet lens, the the price doesn't go up, you know, a factor of 50% because you added 50% more glass. It goes up, it doubles. Right. <laughs> right. Now, spherical aberration, you want to explain to our listeners that don't know what that is? Well, spherical aberration is the primary, one of the two primary aberrations or errors, which is what aberration means, uh, that are caused by the optics. Um, it it um, doesn't allow the focus to, uh, for the whole aperture to be uh, in a point. In other words, if you're looking at a star point, it doesn't focus in a point, but it creates a little disk of confusion, they call it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can get that down to a minimum, but it's still there. Um, the second aberration that uh, that uh, is inherent to the two-element refractor is um, a color aberration or chromatic aberration. Right. And uh, it uh, causes a little fringe of color. Like and, purple tinge to yeah. The bigger the aperture in the refractor, if you have a two element lens, the bigger the aperture, the more that shows up to the point where in large telescopes like the twenty inch refractor or something, you'll actually see uh, you'll actually have different points along the focus as you rack in the rack and pinion the focuser in and out. You'll get the blue focus or you get the red focus. Mm. But you won't get everything in focus at once. I, I I was very disappointed the first time I looked into a big refractor, which was uh, the Lowell refractor up in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Right. And, and I, you know, you have to use a filter. There's no right. other way. Yeah, fil- there are filters that counteract that condition. That's true. Uh, they, yeah, but who wants to look at a, a blue moon all the time? You know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. All right. So for the, that's it for the refractor. Now the next yeah. type of telescope you might look at is a reflector. Uh, yep. These are the telescopes. When people say they're going to build a telescope, this is the most common because yep. it's gr- it's grinding your own mirror type of thing. And there's still people I out there. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that, right? But uh, what are some I'm of the gonna... advantages of a reflector telescope? Well, the reflector you don't have the chromatic aberration. Mm-hmm. And if the mirror is made correctly, you've done your job right. I've made a lot of mirrors. In fact, I'm a certified opti- optician. Right. Um, uh, I, I made a lot of mirrors up to 18 inches. And um, 
if you do it right, you've got you've got no chromatic aberration, you've got no spherical aberration. And uh, for for um, lunar and planetary observing F8 to F10 are are good focal ratios. Uh, that that F number means how many times the aperture is your focal length. So mm-hmm. it's a six inch F8 is 48 inches focal length. Um, and, and you get a good, a good view, a good sharp image that way. And it's done at a much lower price than the refractor. Oh yeah. Six, a good, a quality six inch refractor will cost you eight to $12,000 and a quality eight inch reflector is, could be under 600. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, um, and I strongly recommend people also buy used equipment if they can. Yes. You can you could save a boatload of money that way. Yeah. There's a lot of telescopes out there that people bought at one point in their lives that are just collecting dust in a closet and, uh, yep. and a good place to find those. There's a, uh, there's a website it's called starry nights. In fact, that's, that's yes. where, that's where I bought my last two telescopes. Well, from, there's, so. there's starry nights. There's or, I'm cloudy, sorry, nights. cloudy nights, cloudy nights, that's what I'm cloudy about. nights, calf, uh, classified. Mm-hmm. Starry Nights is, is one that used to exist. I don't know if they still exist. I no, I don't think they do. And then there's Astro Mart. Yes. And then, of course, the the uh, good old eBay. Right. Um, but um, there's also, look at your local um, telescope shops here in Tucson. We've got two of them. We've got Stellar Vision. And he tends to deal with newer equipment. Um uh, but there's also, um, uh, oh, oh, dear me, now I can't think of it. Hmm. But we have another shop here in town um, uh, that, that sells mostly used equipment. Hmm. And he's got like 200 telescopes on the floor. Wow. And uh, um, no, I'm sorry. St- that is Stellar Vision. Star Arizona is the one that sells okay. the new equipment. Okay. And and he's online and they're yeah. they're both online, but Star Arizona's all over the place online. And um uh, that's Dean uh, uh that, that sells equipment there and, okay. and Frank okay. Frank Lopez is at uh Stellar Vision. And I know them both and they both know me. Okay. But uh, you can you can save a boatload of money buying used that yeah. way. Even local astronomy clubs you find people that have telescopes they're not no longer using. That's true. That's yeah. true. And sometimes they even run a classifieds in their uh, newsletter. Right. That's true. Now with the reflector, what are some of the disadvantages of a reflector telescope? A reflector telescope? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, disadvantages, I think, would be just uh, um, getting it to uh, acclimate at, at the beginning of an evening. Uh, if they're warmed up during the day, if they're in a, a building or something, uh, it takes them a while to acclimate. But other than that, um, acclimation, uh, they require more alignment attention mm-hmm. than a refractor. Um, but that's really such a, such a minor issue. Um, I had, I had a 14 inch F six reflector that was an absolutely superb telescope, but after falling off a ladder twice, my mm-hmm. wife encouraged me to get something closer to the ground. And that's when I went with the, <laughs> what's going to be your next topic the cassegrain uh, that's right now the cassegrain telescope uh if we go back a little bit we'll call the schmidt cassegrain telescope sure uh, those became popular in the I, I would guess the 70s with celestron doing their old c8 telescope the old orange tube telescope well even before that um uh, is just the straight cassegrain without the corrector lens okay um uh cave Optical sold them for years. Really? Oh yes, the regular Cassegrain. I owned a ten-inch cave, huh. and um, so they they had straight straight Cassegrains and uh, and also uh, Tinsley. Okay. Tinsley had regular Cassegrains as well. I go back a long way <laughs> with all of this <laughs> stuff, um, and and. Um, I, I liked. I always loved the Tinsley designs and everything, but they were kind of pricey, mm-hmm. so uh, I never had one. 
but I did have a cave 10 inch cast of grain for a while. Okay, describe what a cast of grain is. A cast of grain is it has a parabolic mirror like the Newtonian telescope, but instead of having a little um, flat mirror at the top of the tube that directs the light to the eyepiece at the side, it has a, <clears throat> a mirror that's a hyperbolic secondary mirror and sends the light back down to the primary mirror through a hole in the center of the primary mirror. And that's where the focus is achieved. You usually wind up with uh, focal lengths that are around F12 to F16 or 17 uh, with those telescopes. And they're very good for lunar and planetary observing. Yeah. And and that's because the light is basically folded within the tube. It's bouncing back and forth. So you don't need a, a tube that's twice that long. Right, exactly. Like you would in a refractor or a reflector. The yeah, in a, in a reflector, an F10 reflector would be, you know, a six inch F10 would be a 60 inch long telescope. Right. But an F10 Cassegrain might be only uh, um, two feet long. Right. Yeah, because the light's bouncing around inside. Right. Okay. Uh, advantage? Advantage, you said? Yes. Well, obviously, um, compact. Mm-hmm. Um, as my as as I discovered after falling off a ladder a couple <laughs> of times, uh, you are closer to the ground, and that makes it convenient. And if you're doing imaging, as I do all the time, um, you, your camera's right down there next to you. It's not up in the air. Right. So that's a big advantage. And that allows dis- you to focus more easily and change what, filters. What's the disadvantage of the cast grain? Disadvantage of the cast grain? Um, gosh, I can't. I can't <laughs> hardly think of one. Uh, I guess um, alignment is much more uh, tricky. Oh, really? Uh, you've got to have the alignment dead on with a cast grain. And with a Schmidt Cassegrain, that becomes even uh, more important. Schmidt or Moxidov, that it becomes even more important. But um, yeah, I, I would say alignment. Um, some makers of Cassegrains put little weights. You'd have the secondary mirror up there on a little spider mount, which is a little four vein thing. Uh, that that's a disadvantage. The four veins instead of is a disadvantage over say a. Re- refractor which has no obstructions in the tube right um but they'd have a little counterweight on the back of the the uh um secondary mount to kind of counterweight the weight of the mirror which i always found kind of unnecessary but it would that's another heat sink in there so um you don't want something that's going to retain heat or retain cold because it's going to distort your uh, seeing in the tube. Okay. Now, jumping down from just a straight cast again, we got the Schmidt cast again that I talked about earlier. Right. Uh, d- describe that. The Schmidt cast again are usually very short focal length mirrors around F2, and they'll be spherical. And then the secondary, ideally, they'll be spherical. Ideally, the secondary will be spherical. And the Schmidt corrector up there um, at the front of the tube will introduce the inverse aberrations to the optical system so that the aber- when it hits the mirrors, two mirrors, the, the corrector's inverse aberrations are compensated for by the aberrations inherent in the two-mirror system. And you wind up with a pretty good uh, optical system that way. And uh, the, they're, they're wonderful telescopes. I've had a lot of Schmidt Cassegrain's. I've had two C14s, half a dozen C8s. I've got a C5 right now that's an absolutely perfect optical uh, hmm. instrument. It was made by, it was actually made by Bob Goff, an optician here in Tucson who passed away a few years ago. And he worked at Celestron, and he helped me clean the instrument when I was going to buy it. Crazy deal. I found it in a photo uh, photography shop with Naga hide all over it and Honeywell <laughs> stickers. Oh, really? And uh, when I took it to him, we saw that was one corner of the Naga hide was peeled up. It was orange underneath. Uh-huh. 
and uh, we uh, we tested it. He looked at the serial number. He says, "I made this one." Really. And so uh, it's it's a superb instrument. I've got some pictures I've turned into the ALPO over the years, taken with that telescope and uh, uh, obtaining a, a two kilometer uh, craters on the moon with that telescope is not difficult at all. What size? It's a five inch. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, on my website, I've got a lunar um, gallery, I'll, I'll call it, a gallery of lunar images. And on that is an article I've written with uh, a table showing what are the smallest features you can see on the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say a two kilometer crater on the moon with the C5, it'll be a dot. It won't look like a crater. It'll be a dot. Yeah, but you can still see it. It will be identifiable. Wow. And when you think, you know, you can step out on your front porch, you can see two kilometers in almost any direction. And uh, so that that's pretty small. Yeah. Now the Schmidt cast were, came into popularity with uh, Celestron and then Mead producing right. these things as well. I mean, they were mass producing these things at one point. And it seemed like you go to a star party and you'd see 25 eight inch Schmidt cast sitting oh, out yeah. there. They're, they're fantastic. They're, yeah. they're wonderful. And they're affordable. They're affordable. They're fantastic. Yeah. Uh, they started up in the 1960s <clears throat> with blue telescopes. Mm -hmm. They're now their trademark colors orange, right? Um, and uh, they they've got to see they've got the C five. I've got a, I've got a four inch Celestron Maksudov cast grain, mm. um, which is a wonderful instrument too. It's it performs right up to the uh, limits of uh, the aperture. Um, so they they produce them at affordable price and. They're making something like 10,000 of these things a year. Yeah. It's incredible. Well, I don't think they are anymore, but that's, that's what, that's what they were doing at the, and, uh, yeah. and plus mead as well. I mean, yes. And yeah. mead's been sold recently. I forget to who Orion. Orion. You're right. Yeah. Right. In a previous podcast. I had the president of Orion on. We talked about that. Yeah. I named asteroids after Tom Johnson and, uh, huh. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just so impressed with what they had done with the Schmidt Cassegrain. They had opened up astronomy to thousands and thousands of people yep. in this country that ne true. never would have been astro amateur astronomers otherwise. Yeah, people were either building their own reflectors or buying Schmidt Cassegrains. That's how it was yeah. for a long, long yeah. time. Well, jump, jumping down to the next one is your favorite and has rapidly become mine because the last two telescopes I purchased have been Maksudovs. So let's talk yeah. about those for a minute. Maksudovs have a slightly longer focal length for the primary mirror, but they have a very small secondary. Um, they can have a very large secondary. It depends on what it's what the Maksudov is is. Uh, made for if it's made for wide field astrophotography obviously you're going to have a large secondary so you have a large field of view but the the um, beauty of the Maksudov is in the small secondary mm -hmm. ones which essentially uh, are as good as a refractor when it comes to resolution and uh, uh, the low uh, contrast or uh, rather higher contrast of the um, uh, image produced and um, uh, it's it's uh, my uh, eight inch. I I got a Questar. A Questar was literally given to me, willed mm. to me. Wow! By one of the astronomers at Case Western Reserve University, uh, uh, C. Bruce Stevenson. Uh, when he passed away, he was only my age at the time. Uh, when he passed away, his wife said he wanted to pass on the Questar to me, so she sent me the Questar. Um, I'd never had one before, and I was absolutely floored by its ability of in resolution. I was resolving Jupiter's moons with it, mm -hmm. um, not seeing any detail on them, but, but I was the resolving them as discs. Yeah, and uh, I started comparing it to my C14, which I had at the time, and I was stunned by how much of the detail seen in the C14 could be seen in the Questar. So I said, 
<clears throat> I wanted to get a larger Questar, basically. And um, no C7s or no Q7s came up for sale. So uh, I went and I found a TEC telescope. Uh-huh. It had been recommended to me by many people. And I bought the TEC 8-inch and I've never looked back. Mm-hmm. I'm resolving one kilometer craters on the moon now. And that's a telescope you use for most of your astrophotography, right? That you're posting? Just about everything, yeah. 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 Um, it's it's a fabulous telescope. Yeah. And uh, the only thing I could wish for is the 10-inch version of it. Um, that TEC telescope, tell, uh, what's it, what does that stand for? Telescope Engineering Company, I think it is? I think so, yeah. Um, Yuri is the optician. I've come to know him over the years. And um, he's he's a fantastic optician, absolutely superb. Beats me. I'm a good I'm a good optician. I could make a living at it, but he's better. Mm. And um, he stopped making the F20 telescopes. My TEC eight inch is an F20. That's the native focal ratio of that telescope. And um, there's only a few F20 10 inches that he made. And I would love to have one, but uh, there's one fr- fellow I know in Mexico that has one. And he said, as soon as he got it, he took it all apart. And I just gasped uh. Um, because um, Montovs, that's one of the drawbacks on a Maxudo. You don't take them apart. A Schmidt Cassegrain, you can take apart. You can clean it and do things to it because the corrector on a Schmidt Cassegrain is zero power. It only introduces the inverse aberrations to the telescope system, but it has no inherent power. Mm. Um, so it doesn't change the focal length. But with a, a, a Moxitov Cassegrain, that thick corrector has a negative power to it. And an alignment is very tricky. And you'll usually see underneath the edges of the um, corrector, you'll see little shims. To, to get that aligned just right. Oh, so really? You, you don't want to be taking that apart. Okay. Not unless you're a real crackerjack optician. <laughs> uh, have yourself an interferometer or something so you can check oh. it after. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, but the alignment of a Schmidt Cassegrain and the alignment of a Moxitov Cassegrain is not as easy as the alignment of a reflector or a refractor. Okay. It's much more tricky because the slightest movement of that secondary, and that's where the alignment usually takes place. You very rarely, almost never have to align the primary mirror. But the secondary mirror, you only have to turn the little alignment screws a tenth of a turn to make a noticeable difference in the image quality at the focus. Okay. So well, if that, I ever that, if I ever need to align my Maxudo, so I'm taking it to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fine. It, it only takes about an hour if you got a good bright star available, but you just don't don't uh, go crazy with that alignment screw. Just very carefully, and if it doesn't get better when you uh, touch the first alignment screw, put it back where it was and go do a different one. Right. You know. Um, it, it takes about an hour, but you get it. And and like me, I've got a rollout observatory, not a roll-off mm-hmm. observatory. Uh, all my equipment rolls out on wheels because I've got a very small yard and a small patio. And um, so the fact that I'm just rolling it back and forth about 15 feet each time, I only have to align it about once a year. Okay. Okay. Well, th- I think we've covered the basic types of telescopes. Is there anything else you'd like to add or talk about any other types of telescopes that are available to the amateur? Well, there are there are some especially available to the, the um, um, ATM, the amateur telescope maker, you know, like things like uh, uh, um, these tri-sheaf Spieglers and things like mm-hmm. that. Right. But if you get to that level where you're building something like that, you don't need me to talk about it. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, very you're, true. you're the expert at that point. Okay. Now, looking at these basic types for the beginner, the first time out uh, just wants to learn this guy. 
learn a telescope, learn how to operate it. And what, what, what do you recommend? I recommend getting into the reflector. Okay. A four and a half inch reflector, something like that. They're pretty, uh, they're about as common as 2.4 inch refractors, but they give you <clears throat> a lot more light grasp. Okay. So I, re I recommend that. Um, there are a lot of reflectors out now that are, uh, oh, I forget the optical design of them, but they have a corrector lens in with the secondary and they make a spherical primary. That's the advantage. See, the, for the manufacturer, you could knock off a spherical primary mirror. You can knock them off in batches of six at a time. Mm. Um, and it's real easy. So you put a corrector. It's a Jones bird, it's called. And uh, the thing, the only downside of those is the alignment. The alignment is more tricky than a straight Newtonian reflector. So um, uh, I'm not a, for a first telescope, I don't recommend those. Mm -hmm. um, I also, well, you'll be getting into that in a minute, but I, the computerized telescopes we'll talk about in a minute. Right, right, right. All right. So aside from telescopes, the probably equal most important thing with a telescope is what it's sitting on is the yeah. mount. And if you are on a flimsy little mount and you breathe on the telescope and it bounces up and down, you're not going to have any fun. You got to oh, have, you got to have a mount that dampens the vibration of the telescope. Every time you touch your focuser, you're going to be moving the telescope. Well, when you get to the mountings, you have to ask the question, how much time do you want to spend fighting with a computer? Mm. Um, a lot of people have been turned off to astronomy because they got a computerized telescope and they don't know anything about computers or possibly there have been a lot of bad motherboards out there mm. for these telescopes. And so uh, they get turned off because they can't get it to do what it says in the instruction book. Right. Um, I don't recommend these for a first telescope. Right. Um, I recommend you don't get computerized. You just get a straight telescope. Now, usually the simplest mountings are the Altazmuth. You have German equatorial first mm -hmm. on your notes list here. But the Altazmuth is usually <coughs> what most people see first. Right. And that's okay. That gets you started. It's good for visual. It's difficult to use for imaging, but it can be used for imaging. Right. You can have a camera on there. Um, the simplest cameras are like um, um, webcams, and you just let something drift through your telescope. Then you use the software to go ahead and stack the image to make a, a proper image of it at the end. But um, so an Altazmuth can be used for imaging, and I've seen mm -hmm. some pretty good images done with them. Um, the, the German equatorial is what I like, mm -hmm. um, just because it's a good sturdy mount. I've got a fork mount on my C5. Uh, I wound up having to build a fork mount out of pieces from other C5 fork mounts. And, um, it works very well. Um, and I've had, of course, the C14 with the big fork mount. I've never had a Dobson, though. I've got one in, in progress on the back porch. I have a 10 and a half inch mirror. I ground it, made myself back in the 1980s. Okay. It's uh it's an F 3.95. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. It's only half an inch thick in the center. Wow. Yeah. I got the glass at Riverside telescope makers conference. Okay. And ground it myself. That was a real job grinding. It was like grinding a piece of rubber. <laughs> Um, but, um, I've got to put that together. That'll be my Altazmuth. And I will just use that, or that'll be my Dobson. I will just use that for visual. Okay. It'll just be a golly look, see kind of a telescope, uh, to show me galaxies or nebulae or whatever, show it to other people on Halloween. We take telescopes out in front of our house mm -hmm. and, uh, before the kids can get candy, they get, they have to look through a telescope. Oh, there you go. 
and uh, it's just get their become, chocolate fingers all over your telescope. Huh? Well, it's become very no. <laughs> they get the candy after. Ah, very yeah. good. <laughs> uh, and but it's become very popular. We frequently have around a hundred visitors to the house. Oh, fantastic! And on Halloween, just I've had people come up and say, "I brought my kids to look through your telescopes because I looked through them when I was a kid." Oh, that's how long I've been doing this. Great, great, great. But- <laughs> so. Uh, uh, the the Dobson's perfect for that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, break the breakdown. The, the alt azimuth mount, like you like you mentioned, is your basic mount. It's left, right, up, down. You yep. manually move it around, and that's it's it's basically point and shoot. Yep. Some of them come computer controlled now that, too. Well, I was going to add that. I recently purchased the uh, Ioptron Pro mount, uh, which is an alt azimuth, but it's all computer controlled, and I'm loving the right. thing. It's extremely. Yeah, well, Ioptron, Ioptron's a good good brand. And, yeah, and, uh, they're going to do a good job on the electronics there. But yeah, you, I, could, you could get some off brands that that aren't done as well, and you're going to have some problems with the electronics or, or the programming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but I've replaced all of my equatorial mounts with alt azimuth mounts now. They're just, to me they're they're lighter, <laughs> easier to set up. You know, I've never, I've never played with that. I don't know how that would work in the software. If you're doing planetary images, for example, and yeah, you well, pick it a two minute, uh, AVI, which mm-hmm. is a stack of a thousand to 2000 right. images of Jupiter. How does the software rotate the image? Yeah. I, I'm that, not, I'm not an astrophotographer. I'm a visual observer. So for uh, me, for me, it's perfect. I, like I say, I've had uh, multiple operations on my eyes, so mm-hmm. I'm not much of a visual observer anymore. Right. 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 But I love 21st century medicine. <laughs> I've had 10 surgeries in the last 10 years <laughs> to my body. And uh, I wouldn't be here doing this right now without 21st century medicine. I'm sure. I'm sure. Now the equatorial mount is what, I believe we all grew up on, you know, it was the, it, it's, it has to be polar aligned, you know, back in the day we had setting circles on the Mount, which, uh, which, I still uh, got them. Which, which are equivalent to the right ascension <coughs> declination of the, the sky that we see. And, you know, they have, they'll have what was called clock drives at the time too on there. And they'll track, they'll track the night sky. They're very, right. they're, they're somewhat easy to set up once you get to look, learn the basics of it um and they work well they work well and they're pretty stable yeah i was gonna say they're robust yeah um i've got on my patio out back unless you know look for it you won't see it i've got a line a north south line and all i have to do is i've got my my eight inch on a um one of these carts um uh, scope buggies i think they're called and it's got a long beam on it and all i have to do is align that beam to the patio line and i'm done i'm polar aligned i'm all done Mm -hmm. it takes about two seconds great but you're not doing any deep sky long long time of no 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 you're doing doing the moon and planets right yeah moon planets and sun i don't do the sun with the eight inch anyway i do the sun with the quest star right so that's a basic German equatorial. That's that's what a lot of the refractors and reflectors come with. Yeah. Um, when you get into I don't sh- mind the crossover. You know, when you get to the meridian, when the object is mm-hmm. uh, um, on the north south line and in the sky, you have to flip to the, the, the other side of the mount. That doesn't really bother me. That yeah, much. no, no. It's it's just one of the quirks of having that type of mount. Yeah. Now we get into the folded telescopes, the cast, the Grand Schmidt cast, the Maxudoffs. A lot of those come on fork mounts. Yes, they do. Which, which is basically an arm on either side of the telescope that runs down to the central base that does right. all the rotation. And it's it's basically like an alt azimuth mount. Ah, uh, yes and no. It still has to be polar aligned. It has to be, it has to be polar aligned, right. Uh, but but it's motion. It's got clear. its own drawbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to work on things close to the pole, plus seventy de- uh, declination or whatever, uh, it becomes kind of cumbersome. 
Right. Uh, Cause your eyepiece is going to be down inside the fork. Right. Um, so that, that's a little annoying Well, you don't have that with the German mouth. Mm -mm. Um, so each mount's got its own pluses and minuses, but if you're just doing lunar and planetary, um, the fork mount's fine. Yeah. Cause the, the, the focus is always going to be accessible. Right. And now the last one I have listed here is Dobsonian. Well, Dobsonian is a telescope basically, but it's also the mount that was designed by John Dobson back right. uh, in the fifties and sixties when the San Francisco sidewalk astronomers, right. It was, right. It was a it's large just... portable telescope, easy to set up, uh, out to azimuth, basically it just rotates right. on a base and the telescope moves up and down, but right. they're, they're made it inexpensively. Uh, a lot of particle board and things like that, put them together. Those are the, when you, when we used to go to the Riverside telescope makers convention, that's what we saw out there. We saw homemade Dobsonians with people that ground their own mirrors. Right. And they came up with all kinds of platforms mm -hmm. that the telescope would sit on. So it would be driven equatorially. Right. right. I and remember one year I saw a, a, the guy called it a hiss drive. It was a uh, rubber inner tube underneath the telescope, and he would let sure. the air out, and it would actually, it would actually move it across the sky. It was pretty wild. I love that about Riverside. Yeah, um, is is all the innovations and and uh, uh, inventions that right. people did. That's true. Yeah, we miss that conference out here. Yeah, so those are the basic mounts and. Uh, and finding the one that you want for your telescope. I mean, you don't need to buy the whole package together. You can find the telescope you want and put it on any one of these mounts pretty much. So that's, yeah. that's the key. You want to mix and match. And it all depends on what you want to use your tel telescope for, but above and beyond that, if you're going to buy your first telescope, the one, th the, I, the number one thing I see as doing this podcast and my questions I get when I'm out at star parties is you have to manage your expectations when you're looking through the eyepiece. Right. Don't get a 2.4 inch telescope and expect to see the spiral arms in uh, the Andromeda galaxy. Exactly right. I mean, the most when, when people have an expectation in their brain of what something should look like through the telescope, it's based upon a photograph they saw in a magazine or on the internet or things like that. And those, I mean, I look at your photographs of, of Jupiter and Saturn you're doing right now on Facebook and they're amazing. But I look through my telescope and that's not what I see. The stuff we're doing today, and that has to do with the camera. Mm -hmm. um, these high speed cameras that are built off of webcam uh, right. um, designs, they just have better electronics by them, are creating photographs today that were utterly impossible 30 years ago. Right. Um, uh, the, the pictures of Saturn and Jupiter I'm doing with the eight inch would have been bragging material with a 16 inch mm -hmm. back in the seventies and sixties. So, um, those expectations, you know, you, you start, you, you learn how to operate software. There's a lot of freeware out there. Uh, I used to write articles in the local astronomy club newsletter. Each article would be about a different piece of freeware. Mm -hmm. It would make your astronomy better. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, there's a lot of good freeware out there. Um, you don't have to go and, and, and pony up the money for Photoshop because GIMP is out there. All right. And, and it does all the stuff that, that Photoshop does, but it's free. Right. And, and uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that out there. And, so managing your expectations in astrophotography um, is, is probably a little easier today yeah. than it was 20, 30 years ago. And I, and I come from the other side as an observational astronomer, uh, managing your expectations when you look through the telescope. Because if you're looking through a telescope for the very first time and I'm standing next to you, I'm going to see more than you see. Because the longer you oh, look yeah. through a telescope, the more you train your eye to find the, the finer details and things like that. I mean, right. I've, we've all gone to star parties where, and I've said this before in the podcast, where someone will have a galaxy in a 14-inch telescope, 
and I'll go up and say, you know, I can see the spiral arms and things. Like, oh yeah, that's beautiful. And someone who's never looked through a telescope before sees a faint fuzzy smudge. Yeah. yeah. And it's because their eye hasn't been trained. And the more you look through the telescope and that's the basis of the uh, Alpo training program that I run. It's not based upon astrophotography. It's based upon training the observer to observe. It's, 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 um, it's a kind of thing where you're looking at a planet, say Mars, mm-hmm. and you have to know how to make your eye relax. Right. When your eye relaxes, all this detail pops out. Well, and it's also having patience at the eyepiece, too. Because yes. I'll, I'll look through the telescope for 30 seconds at a time, and I'll have maybe one or two seconds when the scene calms down perfectly wow. and the image jumps out at your eye, and you're like, holy mackerel. Did yeah. I see what I just and, saw? And, fil- and the use of filters. Yeah, yeah, color filters. That's a whole different area to look at. Um, I have a podcast that, special just on filters. When I was doing visual, I also had a prism mm-hmm. that amount, uh, mounted to the eyepiece, a low-angle prism. I think it was only one or two degrees, but it would compensate for the atmospheric refraction. Mm. So where the, 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 any object, as it gets more than 10 degrees away from zenith, starts to pick up uh, um, atmospheric refraction where the atmosphere acts like a prism and smears right. the object out into colors. And, and it only has to be 10 degrees away from the zenith. Um, it, do, it doesn't have to be much. And it you get that far away and you're already smeared out one arc second. Yeah. And so it, it becomes important to find a way to compensate for that. That's true. Yeah. The scene is your worst enemy with any telescope. Um, It's it's, if if it's a, if you look through your telescope and a bright star image is boiling and you know, your scene is terrible. And I would, I I would make another observation here. Okay. It's something when I had the C14, I did a bunch of off axis apertures on it. I -hmm. wanted to see how good was the seeing typically at my site. Okay. And I learned that to have a telescope of more than eight or nine inches aperture was not advantageous here. All it did is made the image brighter and blurrier. Mm-hmm. And that eight inch was about the max for my site because I've got asphalt around me right. and things like that. I live in the desert mm-hmm. where we have 110, 115 degree temperatures in the daytime. Right. And uh, so everything heats up. Even trees are uh, exuding heat at the end of a day. <laughs> um, so if you're looking over a tree at something, you'll actually see the heat coming off the tree. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> learning about your observing site, where are you going to do most of your observing before you buy a telescope? It's kind of an important thing. That's true. And uh I've got articles I've written on that. I probably should publish one in the Jalpo, but um, it's it's an important uh, experiment you should do. It, it it really is. That goes with managing your expectations, and even exactly. when you buy. I mean, well, we could talk later about accessories you buy, like eyepieces. Don't go for more power. I mean, more power. You you can play with power with a Barlow lens and things like that. But what you want is good eye relief in an eyepiece. You know, good field of view. Yeah. When eyepiece. I was growing up. Uh, with the RV6, I've, you probably got them too. Mm-hmm. Those acrobatic Ramsden eyepieces. Yeah, still, still got a couple of them. You, you know, you know, those are good for one thing. <laughs> They've got so much residual color because of the poor design of that eyepiece that if your planet is low in the sky, you can actually put it in the field of view off to one side or the other and act, compensate for the atmospheric refraction that's with funny. the refraction that's inherent in the eyepiece. Yeah. <laughs> it's possible to do that. Yep. But th- no, the eyepieces today are so much better. I don't know why they came up with Huygens and achromatic Ramsden eyepieces mm-hmm. when, when the Plossel is such a simple design. Right. And uh- it's it for lunar and planetary observing, it's just about all you need. Yeah, and and you could spend on an eyepiece what you spent for your telescope easily. Oh my gosh, yes, easily. And some of them weigh as much as my. That's first telescope. yeah, some big two inch eyepieces that I've got. I mean, I got to put a counterweight on my telescope when I put them in. <laughs> 
Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it, it's crazy, but going back to the learning curve, and these are just some of the things that as you spend time at your telescope, you know, once you've got the one you want, you're going to have to take time and learn how to operate. Like you mentioned computerized telescopes. Well, that's what a lot of newbies are jumping in that way. Because well, that's, that's they fine as long as they get good software and good electronics. And they don't they don't want to spend the time learning the sky like we had to do when we were kids, you know. But yeah, uh, that's that's unfortunate. But the learning curve is part of the fun of the whole thing. It, it really is. And even with new like with software though, the computer controlled telescopes, there is a learning curve. I mean, I've been doing this for many, many years. And I went, I just went from German Equatorial to uh, you know, the the Ioptron. Alth azimuth mount, and that was a different learning curve. I mean, it's okay now. How do I operate this? How do I balance the telescope? It's a whole different method of doing that as well. well so these I've, things you need to think about when you're buying your first telescope. Well, I've I've um, improved in my handling of my imagery through software over mm -hmm. the years, and uh, I'm waiting for the next clear night when um, I have a red spot transit on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the Questar out. I'm going to do image the red spot transit, probably four or six images over the space of three or four hours. And then I want to process that with my current knowledge and current software and see if I get a better image. I've, I've with that telescope, I have imaged a transit of the shadow, a shadow transit mm -hmm. of Titan on Saturn. Oh, my. And so... Uh, I want to see what I can pull off with Jupiter now, knowing what I now know, and with the software I've learned how to operate. Because there's an awful lot of software out there. That's true. And there it's is. free. So much of it is free. That's true. Now, I like I say, I literally ran for years, ran a monthly article on freeware. Every month I would have a different piece of freeware I'd highlight. Yeah. Now, getting into astronomy, getting your telescope, I mean, not everybody wants to do astrophotography. Not everybody wants to do observational astronomy. I'm on the observational side, and my recommendation is just spend time with the eyepiece. You know, I, I, I know guys, and present company, company excluded, hopefully, that the first thing you do when you put your telescope out is you put an eyepiece in. You don't put your camera on. <laughs> oh, see, now the only time I look through an eyepiece is to center something. Okay. <laughs> because the, the view is just not pleasing anymore. Okay. Um, I've got I've got uh, a retina that's been uh, lasered back together several times, yes. and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so. Um, well, it's good. You can still do valuable astronomy, though, too, with your astrophotography. I love having the nice big computer screen to look at. <laughs> There you go. And it, it, it makes up for all the inadequacies of my eyes. Yeah. And so it's great. And, yeah. Um, and, and I get a permanent uh, takeaway, if right. you will. Right. Um, With your image. I, yeah. I get these images, and uh, I'm producing them every day, just about. I know yeah. you are. I see them on <laughs> Facebook <laughs> every single day. They're amazing. The desert Southwest, you know, the weather out here oh, today, it's cloudy. I can't mm -hmm. do the sun today, but uh, there's not much up there right now anyway. Okay. Now, another factor that people are concerned about when they're buying the first telescope is price. Yep. Now, if you're just getting into the hobby, you know, you're not the type to spend $10,000 on your equipment to get started, but you have. You also have to consider the price to the uh, divorce lawyer. <laughs> now that's after you buy three telescopes <laughs> unless unless you marry an astronomer like there you I go did. oh you, yeah you sold your first telescope to her so that's kind of yeah right kind of helps. i'm sure you tell her every time you buy an accessory too right i don't really buy much <laughs> okay i don't need more stuff i yeah. need more time that's that's true that's true yeah yeah but for but for price uh you mentioned a good first telescope would be a, a four and a half inch reflector probably a dobsonian or something like that would be yeah. a good starting telescope and or those could celestron be celestron five celestron five kind of a telescope would be nice compact easy to take in and out what's the and ballpark price of that i don't know hmm. um I'm, i hate to you know hate to make your uh uh interview here kind of fall flat but i no. haven't bought equipment 
Okay. The last equipment I bought, I bought a used Dynamax 6. Okay. It was when I was in a wheelchair last year because of mm-hmm. my bad hip that got replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, but I bought a Dynamax 6 because I, number one, I liked Criterion. I had heard all these bad reports about Criterion Dynamax equipment mm-hmm. over the years. And I wanted to see for myself. And I got this Dynamax 6 on a you know tripod and everything for under $300. Yeah. And I said, you know, why not? And uh, I used it. You saw the pictures last year because mm-hmm. I couldn't get out the 8-inch last year uh, in the condition I was in. And um, I took great. I, oh, I did the Mars apparition with it. Right. A Jupiter Saturn. Uh, I I did my first good Mercury images with it, and uh, so I found out that it's a perfectly good telescope. So that kind of a telescope, if you can buy something like that mm-hmm. used, if you know somebody that knows telescopes and can test it for you, you can save a whole lot of money. Yeah, buying used. Yeah, I recently so- I recently bought a. Uh- Skywatcher 127 millimeter Max suit off, off, yeah. off cloudy nights. And I paid 350 bucks for the tube assembly. That's a gonga. Uh, it's yeah. It, it, it's a great telescope. I love it. Uh, I mean, it. It's now my portable telescope. I just pop out on nights and, and yeah. use and I, and I've put that on an Alta Azimuth uh, go to mount as well. So that's, but it's, I, I got an OTA of a Celestron four inch Max suit off. Now they come on a plastic, Altazmith mount. Right, right. But the guy I bought it from didn't like the mount any better than I did. Mm. And he sold me the OTA for 250 Yeah, wow. And that is a sweet little telescope. Yeah. It's a little yeah. bit, a little more aperture than the Quest R, and it does a fine job. Yeah. So uh, um, it's, it's, it's uh, really quite good. And again, 250 bucks that's a very reasonable price. Right. For, so, like, the, and then you can get them out. It's so so light. You can find somebody who broke their two point four inch refractor <laughs> and adapt that mount to fit your telescope. Yep. Um, and that's what I did. And that's yep. if you were doing a visual uh, zoom right now, you would see it. It's right behind me in the mm-hmm. couch here. Yeah. Yeah, but that's. I mean, price. You don't want to go cheap. You want to get the best. <laughs> product and get for what you can get um like we both mentioned we started with the 2.4 inch refractors because that was the available telescope at the time I, that i think i said ubiquitous and that's a good word for that's it. a good word but i did i mean i joined the alpo <laughs> using that telescope i made 300 observations of of the moon when i was in the training program when i was in high school using that telescope so it's it, it was it was functional for me you can still you know, do science with a 2.4 inch. And I, and I did. I, I, I observed the crater atrocities for years to get through the training program. And well, did, the international occultation timing. Oh, yeah. They still do lunar occultations, collect it up. And you can do tons of them, I yep. have, with yep. a 2.4 inch. Yep. And in Michigan, we lived up in Midland, Michigan, which is up near the Saginaw Bay. So we get tons of snow in the winter. Mm-hmm. And I set up a 2.4 inch in the backyard and I built using igloo technology. (laughs) I built an observatory around it and I would do occultations all winter long that way. And so it it works fine. Yeah. 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 So that's a basic of of price. I mean, you you can get a good Dobsonian reflector for three, four hundred dollars. New, yep. yep, for that price. So that that's where I would focus on for new telescope, buy, you know, buyers. If you want to get into it, that's not for astrophotography. That's for visual observing only. So that's right. now portability is also a major thing. I mean, I'm going to be 65 this year. You're you're a little older than me, yeah. And that's a <laughs> and that I don't feel it. <laughs> and that's a. And that's a major <laughs> deal right now. That's why I have downsized. I mean, I've gone away from the German equatorial mounts because they're just more more cumbersome to set up. If and that's why I've on, gone away from refractors to the Max Sudovs because they're shorter 
focal length tubes and they're lighter. Yeah. And if, you know, if you are an older observer or you have special needs, you should keep that in mind mm -hmm. as you purchase equipment. Not, not, don't buy what you're best with today because five years from now, you may not be. Right. Try to think a little bit ahead and um, also listen to your spouse when she doesn't want you falling <laughs> off ladders. Um, that's an important thing too. maintain, maintain marital bliss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Along the line with portability though. I mean, are you going to observe from your house or yeah. are you going to, or are you going to pack it up and take it somewhere? So will the telescope fit into your vehicle? These are things you need to think about as well. And then when you get out there, how are you going to power this telescope? If it's yeah. electronic I mean, you may, and you may want to think about, do I want one here and one to travel? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, I've got traveling equipment too. I've got yep. ETX and things like that, yep. that I uh, take the solar eclipses. And, um, yeah. It's like, I got that five inch Maxuda right by my front door. And if it's a nice night, I'll just pick it up, carry it outside and right. do some observing. I mean, that's what I do. And then I've got my six inch Maxuda on the bigger mount that I will pack up and take, you know, but it's, it's, it, it's, these are things to consider when yep. buying a telescope is there anything else you want to add rick to this not really uh we've really covered a lot of ground here it's been a great discussion and your expertise in optics has really helped out as well well i did what i could uh, <laughs> uh, additional accessories um uh i see you've got on there and we haven't covered that but okay. uh back remember when coulter started making the big new uh, newtonians yep, yep. Uh, they they showed up at Riverside one year with mm -hmm. a steak truck. And the steak truck had, I think it was the 30 inch. I remember that. On there. And uh, I remember yelling out to them as they drove up if the truck was an accessory. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. No, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's insanity. That that that's not a telescope you want to move around. Although no. I know one guy shows up at Texas Star Party a lot. He's got a Cooper. His car is a Cooper. A little and Mini he, Cooper. Yeah, a Mini Cooper, and he's a big guy, mm. and he's got like a twenty-four inch telescope that unfolds out of that Mini Cooper. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to watch the process. I should have done a video on it. <laughs> Um, just because it's so amazing to see him unfold out of that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we mentioned additional accessories. Eyepieces are things. Yeah, you know, well, eyepieces are easy today. They're all over the place. They're all over the place. You know, filters you mentioned. Uh, yes. There's, there's filters, filters. Are important for a lunar and planetary observer. Uh, don't, don't sell yourself short on filters. They, That's right. I, I have a really good podcast that I interviewed a gentleman who did an analysis of all sorts of color filters uh, about six months ago. And I'd recommend anybody who's interested in color filters, go back and take the, give that a listen. Cause it, it's really, really well done. I found I him mean, actually on cloudy nights. He had written an article there and I interviewed him because of his article. He really broke down the, the merits of different types of color filters very well. But um, there's also filters that, that help improve the night sky as well. Take away yes. sky glow and things like that. We last year when we had the Mars opposition, it was very frustrating for us here mm -hmm. in the Southwest because we also had tremendous fires mm -hmm. and our sky was filled with smoke all the time. And um, then Mars had a dust storm at right. one point. And it was like, you know, you're looking at a little blank disc. So I went, I went and bought a, uh, an 850 nanometer filter and pierced all of that. Wow. And I could see details on Mars. And I was a happy camper after that. <laughs> you were. Yeah, filters are amazing. Uh, I remember I was at a star party once. I had my five-inch refractor out. And I was set up next to a C-14. And we were both looking at Jupiter. And I had a blue 80 filter in the telescope and he didn't have any filters. And I looked through mine and I went, Oh, pretty nice. And I went over the C14 and I couldn't see the, nearly the detail that I had through mine. And it was, I attributed it all to the filter. Yeah. The 88 filter is a really yeah. nice one for planetary viewing. Right. Right. That's it. Yes. Yeah. It's 
kind of made me feel good when I have a little fra- little refresh. So those are the there. kind of accessories that are that are good additions. Another accessory, I think I touched on at the very beginning, have made enough of, uh, noise about it. Barlow lenses, mm-hmm. good ones. That's um, that. That's a good point because the Barlow lenses we grew up with are not the Barlow lenses of today. No, no, not at all. Today they're uh, doublets and triplet lenses. Mm-hmm. We grew up with singlet lenses, right? Um, and there's there the, those are the little eye lenses that would give you your 600 power that they advertised. Yeah, I remember being out in the front yard looking at Vega with a 2.4 inch telescope, two Barlows, and a six millimeter lens. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and think, you know, like just just because I thought I was closer. <laughs> you were getting um, closer. To uh, so so. Yeah. Um, and those were horrible Barlows. Those, yep, they those were Japanese Barlow lenses. Yep. So um, today, I recommend an amateur astronomer that's going into lunar and planetary observing get a 1.5, a 2, and a 3x Barlow. There you go. Uh, I can't use Barlows with the F20 telescope because you, you, it just the, the image falls apart. You start getting up to F30, F40. That's no, it doesn't work. Hmm. But uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, magnification for the Celestron. Yeah, that works well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. This is a good discussion here, Rick. Okay. Uh, how can everybody get a hold of you if they're interested in seeing your astrophotos or uh, have questions for you? Well, I've got um, a lot of mine are in the gallery, the ALPO gallery. If you go to the ALPO website, they've got a gallery or archive there. Mm-hmm. And you go to that and you'll see my images plus images from a lot of other people that are even doing better than me. And um, otherwise, I've got a website at uh, www.lpl.arizona.edu slash tilde, which is a little sideways squiggle, R Hill. You go to my website there, you can prowl around in the Jim Loudon Observatory and you'll find my archive there. Okay. And I will put a link for that in the show notes where people can just click on it and go and check it out. Okay, check out the link yourself before you write it up, though. And I will make do that. Sure you got it right. I will do that. Well, Rick, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. This was very right. helpful. Well, it's been fun doing this. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. Again, I want to thank Rick Hill for coming on. And talking to us about telescopes. For those of you out there shopping for them, I hope the, the, this information was helpful. We upload new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. If you would like to subscribe on iTunes, we really appreciate it. You can also rate and review us. You can also listen to us on Apple Radio, iHeart Radio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, Amazon, Echo, and also Spotify. You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon by giving up to $35 a month where you receive one year's membership to the Alpo and producer credits on the podcast. And with that, I want to thank the producers of this podcast, Steve Seedentop and Michael Moyer for their generous support of the Observer's Notebook. The link for Patreon as well as the link for the Alpo is down below in the show notes. You can contact me if you have any questions at cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at at ObserversNBPod. Until next time, my hope is you always have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening.